Hello, welcome. Uh, my name's Lenore Taylor, Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian Australia, and I'm joined here today by three eminent women who are bringing special insights to the conversation we're about to have, which is all about where Me Too has got to after a year and what needs to happen from now. I'm going to introduce our panel in a second, but first I just wanted to sort of explain where we're going to go today and the thinking behind this panel. It's more than 10 years now since Tarana Burke started a movement with that hashtag, Me Too. It's just over a year since that global kind of wave of anger and determination that something needed to change. It was so fierce, it sort of felt like something had burst. And a lot has changed in that year, willing, women's willingness to talk about what is happening to them. Most importantly, I think, the willingness of others to listen to what they say about what's happening to them. But we know that there are still a lot of impediments to that momentum, big systemic things, big things that are difficult to change, which kind of stands to reason, because I guess the patriarchy had been around for a while. We're seeing big impediments in workplace regulation and culture, legal impediments um, to women being believed, which still means many women don't tell stories, legal impediments to journalists actually reporting these stories, especially here in Australia, defamation capital of the world, huge impediments to change for, the, for women who aren't assaulted by uh, rich, powerful men and who aren't movie stars, everyday women harassed or assaulted every day by everyday men. A lot has changed, but there is so much that still needs to change. At a speaker's dinner last night, we heard from one of the other presenters here today, Soraya Chamali, about rage, that justifiable rage, um, and how we can channel it to positive ends. And I thought about some of the things that have made me angry in this last year. The survey that was released by the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, that found one in three Australians had experienced workplace sexual harassment in the past five years. Reading submissions to her national inquiry, hundreds and hundreds of stories from ordinary women, story after depressing story about women who felt like they couldn't say anything because they needed their job, who said something and then had to leave their job anyway, whose complaints were dismissed or not acted on or not acted on effectively. I feel rage that Brett Kavanaugh, sitting on the US Supreme Court in recent days, dissenting from a judgment that, has, that kept the last abortion clinics open in Louisiana, and Christine Blasey Ford had a GoFundMe page to pay for rehousing and security because her family was still getting death threats. So, we have a lot to talk about. And to help me talk about it today, we have, on the far end, Emily Steele, a business journalist on the New York Times who was one of the Times reporters central in revealing that Fox News had paid out $45 million in sexual harassment settlements involving its star host, Bill O'Reilly, after which he was fired. She and a team of reporters have exposed sexual harassment <laughs> across a range of industries for which they won a Pulitzer in 2018, and boy, they deserved it. Uh, then we have Sahila Abdul Abdulali. Sahila was, the first, Sahila was the first Indian woman to talk publicly about being raped. That was an article she wrote in 1983. Then she got on with leading a, su a successful and happy life, and then 30 years later, after another horrific rape in India, she was astonished to find that her story from 1983 had gone viral, and she was apparently still the only Indian woman who was talking about being raped. Uh, so she's written a book about it, which I highly recommend, what we talk about when we talk about rape. It's really thought-provoking. And we also have Tina Chen, who's done many fascinating things. Uh, she's a prominent lawyer who's now gone back to a very interesting part of the law, but she worked for President Barack Obama. She was chief of staff to Michelle Obama. But critical to this discussion is the fact that she was co-founder of the Times Up Legal Defence Fund, set up to uh, provide legal advice, pro bono representation, particularly to low-income women, and to figure out how to change workplace culture. So we have a really great panel to talk about these things. Okay, so we're going to start with, five, it's like, like speed discussion. Five minutes from each of these women about what they think has been the biggest achievement or the biggest change for Me Too so far, and then the impediments 
to the biggest impediments uh, that we face at this point? I'm going to start with Emily. So the timing of this whole event is really, really interesting to me because about two years at this time, I was working with my colleagues and the editors at the New York Times to get our story ready to publish. This was a story that would expose that there had been millions of dollars of settlements paid out to women who had said that Bill O'Reilly had sexually harassed him. Bill O'Reilly was one of the biggest, most powerful figures in all of cable news in America. He, was the mo he had the most watched program in all of cable news, and he was making $25 million a year at this point. What was really extraordinary about our reporting was not just that he had acted, that there were allegations that he had acted in this way, but it was also the cover-up, and that the company had known about this, the board had known about this, and there was an entire system, a conspiracy of silence, is what we like to call it, surrounding this issue. And what happened at the Times is we published this story. It landed on April 1st of 2017, and it kind of lit the world on fire. There were protests outside of New York City. An airplane flew across the city that said, drop O'Reilly, the sexual predator. And women started to tweet their own stories of sexual harassment using the hashtag drop O'Reilly. And what editors at the Times realized is this is a big issue. We really need to keep reporting on it. And so that's when we kind of fanned out across Silicon Valley and Hollywood and a Ford auto factory in Chicago to really look at this issue. And what we realized is that it was not these individual problems and these individual predators, but it was a whole system systemic problem where women did not talk, they didn't bring up these issues because they didn't think they would be believed. There were these NDAs that were these very ironclad agreements that prevented women from talking and it allowed predators to continue to, um, to harass other people. And there was the HR systems were broken. And so I think really what, what we've seen in this past, these past two years now is there's been hundreds of hundreds of powerful men who have lost their jobs. We've seen that this is a problem from rich people, from poor people all around the world, but it's that system that I'm committed to continue to report on and that I think is really ripe for change. Great. Sahala, do you want to? Me, the timing of Me Too was also interesting because I had just started writing a book on what I thought was a really obscure topic. And then suddenly Me Too exploded. <laughs> and so I had a moment of thinking, maybe I don't need to write this book. And then I kind of started to see what Me Too was good for and what it didn't do. And what it didn't do was because it was such a social media-based thing, it didn't really get into a lot of the nuances. So I continued, but I, I actually want to talk a little bit about Me Too in India and what's happening and what should happen. Um, in the beginning, when Me Too exploded here with the Harvey Weinstein and all that, a lot of feminists in India just watched with interest but figured, this is not for us. This is something over there. And a lot of people kind of, all oh, those Americans are at it again. But then, <laughs> but then slowly but surely, a little conversation started behind the scenes. And then the same kind of thing happened there that happened in America where a couple of women just made it explode. And uh, there was Priya Ramani, who was a journalist who was molested by MJ Akbar, who was a minister in the government. There was Tanushri Datta, who's a Bollywood actress who was abused by another person in Bollywood. And the way it exploded in that country was, it, I mean, it, it paled what happened in America because it was everywhere. Men were talking about it, women were talking about it. It seemed really exciting. And for me, what was exciting also was the things that were going on behind the scenes, the people who weren't on Twitter and who weren't hashtagging their abuse, but were still suddenly realizing that this happened to me and maybe it wasn't right. So to make it part of the conversation the way it has been, I think is positive and amazing. But there are huge impediments. For instance, Tanushri Datta is celebrated for being the first actress to out harassment in Bollywood. But what nobody seems to know is that since the day she came out and said that, she has not got a single role. She's, she's just been blacklisted in Bollywood completely. Whereas the guy who abused her is still there having a fine old time. So what I think the impediments are, it's fantastic, there's a conversation. But there's no system, the old systems that allowed 
the abuse to flourish are still very much there. So we need to kind of go into all the system, legal systems, family systems. What happens once you say, me too? If you have no place to go and no one to believe you, where do you go? So that's one impediment. And the other support system I think we need is for all the people who have been abused, don't speak out on me too, aren't ready to, have been successfully denying it, possibly even to themselves, and now it's out there. There's a great level of trauma for people who, have, who don't want to necessarily wake up and look at the headlines every day. And I'm not saying the headlines shouldn't be there, but we need to think about these. That, that's my take on it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys have said like a lot of it. Um, I, I will say it is an extraordinary moment. I mean, I think we should not lose sight of the fact that here we are two years, a year after, you know, Time's Up got started, still talking about it. You know, we've got like this short attention span world and I've been afraid at every moment that the time will pass us by and we'll stop talking about it. But here we are, we're still talking about it. It's still in the headlines. There's a new company every, you know, a couple of weeks that seems to keep it in the headlines. Um, and, and you need to know, because the work that I do now, which is a practice to work with companies on workplace culture, is this is happening in C-suite. So CEOs, heads of companies are getting this and having this conversation in a way that I've never seen happen before. They see it as a matter of urgency. They see it as something they really have to address at, from the top of the organization. And that's a good thing. I mean, that is what it's going to take to change. Um, and I give a lot of credit to the reporters, because I mean, this could not have happened without the extraordinary reporting. I also, every time I talk about this, I acknowledge the women of Hollywood. I do think it made a difference that when it really launched out, it happened in Hollywood for us in the United States. Um, because we've had our moments before. We've had Anita Hill 27 years ago. We even had it during the 2016 elections, and it didn't have that same velocity that this has had. And I think it's because my analysis is, we're such a celebrity-driven culture. Mm -hmm. We watch Ashley Judd, we watch America Ferreira, we watch Reese Witherspoon. We think that they are our girlfriends, right? <laughs> They're not, but we think they are. And <laughs> we like to think that they are. And when they spoke out, at some risk to their own careers, like yeah. what's happening in Bollywood, you know, it was not an easy thing to do, but courageously they did. So that women, average women in America, all of a sudden saw someone they could relate to who had this experience. And then because of hashtag me too, they had a place to say it that was more than just their 10 friends and created then this momentum of thousands of women feeling support and feeling that they weren't the only ones and they weren't by themselves with this, which was huge. But you know, what both of you said about the system is real. I mean, it, you know, this took us a long time to get in the space. We're not gonna get out of it in a year. Um, but there are huge issues around, as you said, legal and structure. But I also don't want us to lose sight of the fact when we focus on the most egregious, the most salacious details, the most outrageous assaults, that this is really connected to workplace culture. It's connected to diversity and inclusion. It's connected to equal pay. It's connected to the entire way we organize work and how we value people at work. It's connected to the microaggressions that happen every day, not just the assaults, but the assuming that the black woman lawyer is the actually assistant that's supposed to go get you your coffee, right? All of those things are part of workplace culture that we need to address in its entirety to really get to the root causes and really change the way workplaces are so that we have what we all want, which are respectful workplaces where everyone feels safe, everyone, men and women and transgender and you know, everyone um, feels safe and respected and able to reach their full potential. That's the goal for everyone. Excellent. So we've gotten... We've gotten directly to these kind of systemic issues that is what I really want to talk about today. And I think now we want to pick them apart a bit in a discussion here on the panel. And then at the end, we're going to have about 20 minutes of conversation of uh, questions from the floor. So as we go along, have a think about uh, whether you want to ask a question. So let's start um, with reporting, um, Emily. So y you talked about the systemic issues that are uh, impediments for reporting, the secrecy, NDAs, um, uh, the defamation laws, which I've got to say are really, make it really difficult to do this kind of reporting in Australia. I mean, it, the, our defamation laws are under review right now. 
but they need to be because while everyone deserves due process at the moment, they mean that many, many of these stories just are not being reported here. And um, there's also just resourcing. You know, uh, you were saying that, you know, you and a team worked on these stories for years. There's not many newsrooms in the world that would these days have the resourcing to um, put that much effort into breaking open a story. So I'm interested in your thoughts about what could change in practical terms to make reporting of these stories uh, easier and, um, and, you know, more effective. I don't... I don't know if reporting on these stories necessarily should be easier. I think that we, as journalists, are very um, have a very high bar to uphold, and these are very serious allegations to be making against sure. people, and we need to take them very seriously. But we also really should be committed to following the facts and being fair and really following the story. And one of the things that really switched with our reporting was I, we had, I was working with this colleague named Mike Schmidt, and we had started to look into this case. And we just kept finding that there were rumors, 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 and then we would find people who couldn't talk. Rumor, 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 person who couldn't talk over and over and over again. And we realized that there were all of these settlements. And for so long, these settlements had been used to silence women and to really protect the powerful, to protect the predators. And we were able to reverse engineer those to actually make the settlements the story. And by doing that, it took the story out of a he said, she said, he said, she said. Um, situation, and we made it into this documented proof of evidence that women could then stand upon and be heard and had those stories be, um, be listened to, which was really extraordinary and a really big shift in our culture. And for me, I think that those NDAs were, were kind of the biggest hurdle, the biggest restriction, and I don't know how those change and how those evolve, but what I do know is that they were used as especially in America, especially in corporate culture, to protect the powerful and to further victimize the victims. Well, and I will say, the other thing that could have happened was for people who did not have non-disclosure agreements um, and women who spoke out, the other thing that started to happen very early on, and this was the original impetus for the creation of the Times of Legal Defense Fund, was many of the rich and powerful men in Hollywood and their rich and powerful lawyers started suing women who were posting on Facebook for defamation. Now, in the United States, when you get sued as a defendant, you don't get legal fees, right? You know, there's no way you are just a woman in the case of Melanie Kohler, who accused Brett Ranner, running a dive shop, having left Hollywood many years before, but wrote on Facebook about what had happened to her years before, and she starts to get these threatening letters. And what we were worried about, this was in the very early days, it happened right away after the first Weinstein articles, was had that continued to happen? And that, has, that was also another play in Hollywood, which is slap them with a defamation suit and we'll make it go away, it would have silenced everyone. And that's why my colleague Robbie, Cole, uh, Robbie Kaplan stepped up to defend Melanie because we were really worried if they got traction, if we could not show women that we would have a legal defense fund that was heavily resourced, I really said before we launched it, we had to have an eight-figure number. It had to be in the tens of millions. It couldn't just be a $5 million number because we had to show them there would be resources behind these women and that women could feel confident coming forward. And then it, it, get, it, it also helps low-income women pursue their own cases, but the really initial impetus was to make sure that that other tactic of suing for defamation, defamation is really damaging, and I really would urge you, not that I should meddle in Australian politics, but I would, I, the fact that you can't talk about this publicly without great fear of being slapped with a defamation lawsuit and ruining your life, you know, even further, is really detrimental to being able to bring all these stories that have been hidden for so long out into the light. Yeah. It happens in India too. All these people I've talked about uh, have been slapped with defamation suits. But I think there's another aspect to reporting which I'm very aware of also because I've been a reporter too. And I think that there's something about talking to... I remember it was really difficult when I was a rookie and I was on that night beat and I was reporting crimes. The story is everything. And you go after someone in their time of grief and you have to talk to them. So I feel like, especially with sexual assault, which is such a sensitive issue, 
part of the issue with reporting is part of the reason survivors might not want to talk is because we don't trust the media. Because the media, we don't trust reporters to look after us. We don't trust them, even if they get it accurately, not to put some stupid headline that has nothing to do. So I think part of the issues with reporting is that the media has to acknowledge that they have the same biases as the rest of us and be careful about those, because we, we do. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a whole different skill set than what you traditionally think of as yeah. an investigative reporter who's this tough and aggressive person who's knocking on doors and demanding the facts and getting right. people to tell this. You have to be softer and you have to be more empathetic and you have to really listen. When you have well, to understand trauma. Yeah. You have to understand how people remember things or don't remember things, right? About what, how, what trauma does to your neurological system and how it makes you... This is what the Christine Blasey Ford, her yeah, testimony yeah. was such an example, and she knew it because she's a yeah. scientist who studies this, about why she remembers certain details and not other details. You know, that's body chemistry working. That's not someone trying to make something up. And reporters... And everyone who hears that needs right. to understand that. Well, and beyond that, even the words we tend to use, I mean, our language is so steeped in sexism in every way. We don't even realize the ways we describe women differently, describe men differently, describe the crime differently. You have to really, like, I feel like every newsroom should have a, a gender check reporter to look at language. <laughs> because we sometimes yeah. perpetuate. Oh, that's right. One, yeah. thing, that's right. one thing. One thing that I do think has shifted and is definitely starting to change though is we started our reporting by looking at this case from 2004 and so like any good reporter I went and did my research and pulled up all the clips of all of the stories of how this case was covered in 2004 and as you probably would believe this woman who had come forward with a public lawsuit was characterized as a sex fiend who was out to take this powerful man down, who had set him up, and the language and the, the headlines around that very much perpetuated this whole victim blaming system. And I do think that in our newsrooms, especially as there are more women and more women in positions of power, I think that we've started to shift how we consider that reporting. Great. Okay, let's start talking about workplaces then. Um, Pretty much every workplace now has a sexual harassment policy. They all say they have a zero tolerance policy. That clearly doesn't work. <laughs> so what are the best concrete measures to actually enable change in workplace culture? What do you need to do to shift this? I think you, you talk about it being a corporate governance issue, but tell me in practical terms, how does that work? Well, the first step, is one of the things we have to acknowledge is our laws around sexual harassment are terrible, right? I mean, the, they go to the lowest common denominator of behavior. And, you know, in the United States, it's been 30 years, right? It's been 30 years since sexual harassment was outlawed by the Supreme Court. And we are where we are, right? Not a lot of progress because... All of our policies have gone to this level of sexual, you know, what, what is illegal under the law, and it's really limited. So, for example, um, the equal opportunity harasser is not illegal in the United States, meaning if you, you know, it, it is a perfectly reasonable and winning defense if you say, oh, I don't just harass women, I harass everybody. <laughs> <laughs> True, it, that is actually the case. So that our laws and all the training, we've all been doing training for 30 years, all the training has been legal limitation liability training, meaning here's what the law says, just don't do that. And since the law bar is so low, it really like, has allowed everybody to learn actually how to legally harass. Get away with. Right, and what you can legally get away with, and it's not about culture. And what companies are starting to realize is they can't just stick to what the law says. They have to extend themselves. Now, they may have their employment lawyers saying, oh, you're not required to do that, so don't do what's not required. In this current environment, more and more companies are realizing, I don't want to bully. I don't want to bully who's bullying everybody. I'm going to have a corporate policy that's about bullying. So that's, you know, that's one of the first steps we've got, we've got to make. Because let's get real, we're not going to change the laws themselves <laughs> in a hurry. Companies need to sort of set, what are my values? Right, what's the kind of workplace I want? Set out a standard of conduct that reflects that and then enforce that, enforce that conduct. Because what I've said to companies, you may take on an additional employment lawsuit from an individual employee. That's probably less risk, though, than having your CEO, a culture that allows your CEO to harass women for years until the moment that you've got to take him down. 
But, but how do you flip the, the obliga obligation, the responsibility? So at the moment, it's the obligation of the harassed or abused employee to make an, a complaint and then the company deals with it. How can it be flipped so it's like an occupational health and safety issue? The, the company has to provide a safe workplace and it's on them. How do you do that? Well, I think that is what the current mo moment is happening. You know, there are the reporting, the enterprise risk, I mean, you were watching whole companies, right, start to go down because they haven't dealt with this. That has put sort of the fear, and we'll take fear as a motivator, <laughs> we'll add fear into other corporate execs who realize I've got to manage this risk. We have investors, right? So big investors in the United States are actually asking the companies they invest in, do you have sexual harassment? That's a huge motivator. And people are now realizing that it is about this whole culture. And you've got to res have responsibility, sit at the top of the organization. It can't be just on the human you know, resources or employment department, you know, what, which often sits five levels down in the organization to struggle with this alone. They don't have the power or the authority to look across the board to know that I've just now done 10 settlements for the same person. And so maybe I got a problem <laughs> with that person. Their job is just to settle out each unhappy employee as they go along. So we've got to really shift this so that it is as important as securities laws, as health and safety laws, that the board of directors is asking the management at every meeting, all right, now what are we doing? What kind of complaints do we have? How are we handling them? What training are we doing around our culture? not just around legal liability. You know, how are we promoting women? What are our diversity statistics? It's also got to look at all of those measures together. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like if you're going to talk about fear as an incentive, another great incentive is actually dollar signs. Yep. Because if I, it seems like if there were more studies done about the economic cost of a workplace that's steeped in fear and intimidation, that's a really good motivator. If happy employees are more productive, then it's the bottom line. Well, and one that's not diverse. Because at the yeah. end of the day, the way we're going to have safe and respectful workplaces is just have diverse workplaces. Right. That really is that we need more women, you know, and people of color in positions of authority. We need, you know, more, you know, of, of every, you know, per, everyone needs to be able to bring their whole selves to work and be able to realize that and realize it safely. And I think, you know, I give a lot of, you know, credit to our millennials who are out there. You guys, the studies show you vote with your dollars on values of companies. Yeah. You vote with your, you know, feet on who you want to work for. Um, and you've been saying companies are right now in a tight labor market in a war for talent. And the more you walk out, if you're a Google, right, because you don't like the conditions there, you're using social media to organize those. Companies are listening and you you are true engines of change as you're doing that. I think there's been a real culture too of protecting the rainmakers, thinking that, oh, we have one set of behavior with standards for the behavior for most of our employees, but this person brings in so much money and we'll kind of just let, let his behavior, we'll just turn our, turn our, um, turn our eyes away from that. But I, I just wonder, when you think about what kind of culture that sets overall, if you have a rainmaker who's allowed to get away with everything, how does that actually impact the bottom line? Absolutely. That's what I think is changing, because I think when you see, like, a Les Moonves at CBS, you know, the you know, guy who really turned that into the most successful network in the, you know, um, entertainment network, and but now what's happened to the company, you know, that, that risk to having a CEO that, it, you know, it, it is misbehaving is now, it, that dynamic has shifted, and that is what has happened that's different yeah. in the last year that did not exist before. Uh, on the issue of diversity, I read a story recently that calculated that there were more companies in the ASX 200, so the top um, companies on the Australian Stock Exchange, led by men named Andrew, than there were companies led by women. Yeah. We, we have the same thing. We have the same thing. Men named John. Or yeah, John, yeah. Robert, David. Yeah. 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 Andrew. Um, which brings us to the kind of broader issue of work-life balance. I know I always get utterly furious when otherwise intelligent women frame that question around whether women can have it all, as if the only way that a woman can have a life and a career is if she somehow figures out how to bend the laws of physics and make 24 hours into 48 and solo do two jobs at the same time. This would seem to be a fairly self-defeating way to frame the question to me. Um, however, I'm interested in the panel's views on this and how we... Um, 
how we address those issues in order to have greater diversity in workplaces. Do you want to start, Emily? I mean, I think it's a huge, 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 huge question. And I'm, I'm 34 years old. I'm kind of at this stage where a lot of my friends in New York are all starting to have babies. And I think that one of the huge shifts that we've seen just in the past couple of years is paternity leave. So I know that the Times, the New York Times will give fathers 10 weeks of paternity leave, which is pretty innovative in American culture. And I think that that, you see the men actually take that time. And I think that it kind of starts from the beginning and resetting the expectations of how do you balance the work and life, and, and also that it's not just the balancing act for the women to do, but yeah. it's, it's both. It's everything. Well, I call them the structural issues. These are the structural barriers yep. that exist in workplaces that don't have to exist in a 21st century workforce. I mean, there's no reason we should have nine to five shifts like we sort of had at the start of not just the last century, but the century before, right? This is industrial revolution work hours, and we don't have to have them right now, and you can work from home. It was a huge issue for us in the Obama administration where we tried, you know, the United States it's us and Papua New Guinea. Since we're so close to Papua New Guinea, I can call them out. Us and Papua New Guinea, the only two countries in the world without a maternity leave policy. It's it. That we still don't have one. We still have 45 million workers in the United States that actually do not have paid sick leave. And let alone talking about maternity leave. We've got waitresses who are coming to serve you your food if you come to New York for a restaurant because they can't take a sick day off. They've got the flu. <laughs> but that... You know, our workplace policies in the United States are really behind the rest of the world. And our argument was, you know, we are going to fall behind in the global economy if we do not catch up. Companies are seeing that, but we still have a huge problem with so many workers in other companies that aren't yet seeing the light, especially hourly workers, you know, and low-wage workers who really do not have access to the kind of, of flexibility that is perfectly companies are able to provide and just aren't. Um, do you want to add in? Um, I just wanted to say that um, we also have to, when we, these are, all, it's really good to talk about workplace policies, but we have to remember that in large parts of the, of the developing world, such as in India, the majority of people are in an un, informal sector. So you, workplace policies go out the window. There's a whole, it's important to think about, but actually they, it's just part of the whole system where they're abused in every possible way. And you can't have workplace policies. You have to start with, acknowledging that there is a workplace. So it's like three steps back for them. Well, the interesting thing is that the developed world is coming close to that because the gig yeah, economy. Yeah. So the gig economy is now you're actually finding lots of workers and very few employers. Yeah. And our laws, again, haven't caught up to where are the workplace protections, right, for Uber drivers or people, you know, who are part-time workers, contract workers. It's a big problem in Hollywood where a lot of what happens on set Mm -hmm. Actually, nobody's protected against. They're, they're the people who are just in there for the day because they're the makeup artist right. you know, or the costume dresser, and they don't work for any particular company. And so you know, that's another area that we are, you know, haven't caught up with trying to figure out how are we going to create workplaces. No matter where you get your check, no matter where right. that money is coming from, you're still entitled to a safe workplace. Right, and a, and a big part of that actually is to remember that whether it's a formal workplace or an informal workplace, the the kind of terrifying things that can happen to you have to do with other terrifying things. Like, if you know, if you're a, in India, again, if you're a low caste woman, you're more likely to get oppressed because if there's a guy and he's looking for someone to oppress, he's more likely to choose you because he knows you have less protection. So that's where equal protection for different, in America, it's race or sexual preference, whatever. You ha they're all very tied all up connected. with this. I will say, I want to give one little shout out in full disclosure, they're a client of mine, but Uber, to their credit, you know, Uber had its issues, but one of the things they're doing right now is um, they extended protections to drivers and riders, and they've taken the courageous step of setting out a taxonomy of 21 behaviors that are, go from leering, you know, to actual assault, that they allow riders and drivers to report on the platform and trying to create a way to systematically keep track of it. And later on this year, they're actually going to issue a report publicly around what kinds of behaviors they're seeing because, as we know, this is so underreported, and if it's underreported, we actually don't know all the ways to solve it because we don't even know where it exists. 
And I give them a lot of credit. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do, to sort of put out a report like that. They're calling on other people in other industries to do the same, because we need to know, you know, is it happening in a particular neighborhood? Is it happening at a particular time of day or night? You know, and then we can develop policies that will really get to root causes. So this is a really great segue into what is going to be my last question of you. But before I ask it, I just wanted to let the audience know there are two microphones. And while we're having this last part of our discussion, if anyone's got a question, could you move down to those microphones so we can get straight into the questions from the audience after this. Yeah, so my final question is uh, leading on from that about how Me Too and these kind of changes translate across the world uh, to cultures where the barriers are much higher than the ones that we face here. I read a story this week about how Me Too hadn't gone too far in Indonesia including an anecdote about a teacher in Lombok who reported her boss for harassment and was then herself jailed for defamation. Or we're hearing at this conference from Lida Hong Fincher about the incredible struggles that are going on in China and from Sahela about India. So, I mean, it, have you got any, any um, ideas, any views about what can happen to, 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 to deal with the barriers that, are, that seem kind of insurmountable from where I sit with not a lot of information? Um. Well, I feel that one of, one of the barriers is the way we ask this question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we still think that we are the center of Me Too and we have to put it out there to all those poor yep. people who can't have access. And while it's true that, say, in many countries, rural women don't have access to the internet, but instead of going over there and, and trying to teach them, I think we actually have a lot to learn. Because the fact is there's been Me Too going on for millennia mm -hmm. in different ways. There has been, you know, like, uh, this is not millennia, this is 30 years ago, but when I was in college, we had, we used to write the name of the professors that you shouldn't be alone with on the bathroom wall. Mm. In the way. So that was the kind of a me too. So rural women, tribal women, Aboriginal women all along have had their coping mechanisms and they were, so we would do well to learn from them and then maybe incorporate that into how we produce this information, and then maybe the, it would be easier to communicate or to, or to get things done because maybe the ways we do it aren't possible in other contexts, and maybe they are, but we won't find out if we don't also listen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Is anyone else looking you know, I, I moved to Hong Kong in October, and I've been trying to do kind of reporting about power and gender and sexual misconduct. There And it's been really difficult. It's been fascinating when you kind of look at what has happened with this movement in that region. And there was one woman who really came forward just months after all of the Hollywood celebrities did. She was an athlete. And pretty soon after she came forward, she was attacked. She was victim blamed. And there were very few people who came forward after that. And so there's still a big stigma about talking about this issue. There's still a lot of shame, people say, involved. And it's not just shame on you, but it's shame on your entire family. And so it's, it's still, it's, it's been amazing because I was kind of like at the epicenter of this movement in the United States and it just felt like it was taking over the entire world. And then going to other places, you realize that there's still a lot more reporting to do. You know, we're at a conference where, you know, we're talking about so many different issues today and all about women. And I think we have to realize this issue is connected to the broader issue around gender equity. And let's get real. Gender inequality is something, talk about millennia, I often say gender inequality is the one thing that has transcended time, religion, geography, ethnicity, you know, name a culture. And there, you know, there is somewhere going on there is gender inequality. So we weren't going to solve it in a year. Of course <laughs> it not. is millennia, but it is all connected. And, you know, in order to deal with these issues, you know, one of my other passions is adolescent girls' education. We're not going to solve it if we've got 98 million adolescent girls around the world who cannot even finish high school because they're being married off as child brides or they're, they're forced labor or they're just not worth investing in as their families see them and going to school. You know, we've got to do all of those issues and address all of them if we're really going to address the fundamental problem here we have, which is gender inequality. Right. Okay, the time has come for some questions from the floor and I think there's someone 
at microphone number one. Hello. There is. Hi, I'm LJ. I'm the chair of Now Australia, which is the Times Up equivalent here. Thank you for an awesome discussion, and thank you for all that you do. Um, Gloria Steinem talks about the inevitability of the backlash, and the backlash is coming, just like winter. How do we prepare, and what do we do? <laughs> I, I didn't hear it. The backlash, where oh, the backlash... Well, I, it's not just coming, the backlash is here. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's be honest. The, ba the backlash is here, you see it, you know, and people, you know, publicly, the Tony Robbins quote, if you've seen that online, where he said, of course, people aren't, like, hiring more, you know, more women. Um, and There's stories about men who won't mentor women or be right. alone in an elevator with them or get breakfast with them. And, and this is why I say you have to look at it holistically. You can't just say, we're going to put sexual harassment over here and diversity and inclusion over here, you know, and pay equity in another box, because it is all about workplace culture. Culture. So you've got to hold, you know, managers accountable both for the kind of safe and respectful workplaces there and their diversity statistics together at the same time because it's all about the same thing. I think it's also about listening to women's voices too. And I think that for so long we've heard these statistics and we knew the numbers, but we weren't really listening to the stories behind that. And that's something that once it's out of the box, you can't put back in. Mm. And it's the whole um, uh, issue can be kind of driven off track kind of quite easily too. We had a, a case here recently where politicians publicly revealed sexual harassment allegations that had been made against a political opponent against the express wishes of the journalist who was allegedly har harassed. And they they outed that information for political gain. So it's sort of this allegation she wanted to keep private became a, a, a weaponized in a political fight between two men. It was um, amazing. And we have another question over there. Hi, thank you for being here and thank you for everything that you do. Um, this question is about how to take action. I work in tertiary education and I have been sexually harassed by my manager. And um, about six months ago, when I told a friend of mine who used to work there, um, she was still working there at the time, she also told me that something similar happened to her, but worse, about six months before that. Now, this colleague has since resigned, and she had also told me that she brought it up with HR, and HR didn't have the right... Um, anything really to do. Um, they spoke to her. Um, there was no confrontation between her and the manager, um, but everything that she said was on record. Um, since then, she's resigned, and when she resigned, HR recognised and thanked her for her work, her services, and the manager said nothing. And this manager has also since been promoted to a higher position. Do you still work in the same place? And I'm getting there. Um, I'm in a very fortunate position that I'm about to leave this workplace. And I don't want to walk away without saying something. And I've spoken to another person who is also in a managerial position who has recommended that I speak up and he's given me all the other, I guess, kind of paperwork to understand what I would have to go through if I would like to take action. And... Like I said, I'm in a fortunate position that I don't need to work there anymore, and I'm about to leave. So, what should I do? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It, it, <laughs> Over to you, Tina. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, th thank you for your for your courage and, and for that. The colleague, one, the one thing from your story that we also know, and I think Emily's reporting has shown, is that people who harass are repeat. They're predators. And they will re repeat and harass, you know, again and again, which is why the silence is so terrible, not just for the individual person. And I also want to stress that this, we're in tertiary education, so this person is in direct contact with, with students. young people yes. all the time. So, so what I'm... But I, I, I feel a little, it's hard, I'm not going to give you advice from the stage, <laughs> it's specific to your case. I will say, it's one of the reasons we created the Times of Legal Defense Fund, is I would urge you to find, you know, a, a, an employment lawyer to help advise you, because I do think you should be protected, you should do this in a way that is safe for you, 
and for your colleagues, um, um, but also I do think it's it's right to do that. I mean, I, I'm not familiar enough with Australian law and the legal system. If you were in the United States, I could give you all sorts of ideas around Title IX because you're in a university setting. There are other mechanisms that we have in the United States. But I, I would urge you, actually, quite frankly, to consult with find find a, find a you know an employment lawyer, and there may be somebody here who will find you, you know, who's an employment law, <laughs> um, because I think I think that would be a, yeah, that would be yeah, good advice. There, there you go, there you go, right there. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, and I want to I want to add to that and say that you know when you talk about fixing things or making things better, there's there's sometimes a contradiction between the right thing to do for society and the right thing to do for yourself. And that clearly the right thing to do is to go ahead with this for society. And that's great. And it sounds like it's the right thing to do for yourself too. But sometimes you're in a position where you feel like because you've been the victim of a crime, it's your job at all costs to go out and get justice. But it's not. It's not, it doesn't have to be your job. And I feel like it's really important, especially for women who are used to doing the right thing and taking care of people, to remember that if there comes a point where it's destroying you to go ahead with this thing that's good for society, it's actually okay sometimes to step back. Um, one, of, one, of the other, one of the other things that we've learned in a lot of our reporting with a lot of these cases is what's really changed is when people have collected evidence. So whether they've taken notes or they have emails or they have recordings or they have photos, whatever that is, it's, it's really helped a lot of people in getting people to listen to their stories and to listen to what happened. And that's been a huge shift. Which is really important. That is a practical piece of advice if you find yourself in a situation, which is to document it at the time, keep, keep hold of texts or emails, and tell people immediately, because the other corroborating evidence, and you guys use it in the reporting that makes it very compelling, is if you told someone at the time, and even though years later, you know, it, it comes up, the fact that people were told at the time is also corroborating. And I think that's, you know, if you find yourself in that situation, those are practical things that you should do, regardless of whether you have decided right, right. to do anything or not, to protect your own yeah. story and your own evidence um, for whenever that may be something that you want, you want to have. Did you want to ask anything else? Um, to follow on. I'm just saying, did you want to follow on? Did you have... um, well, the problem is, is that there's no evidence, as in there was no well, recording. I think you're going to talk to our colleague over here. <laughs> right. Cool. right. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, ladies, for that panel discussion. Uh, my, my question is on a slightly different uh, tangent. I work and have a lot of male friends, you know, middle-aged men, who are, who are good, decent men, you know, on the whole, as many men are, but who are all... When, when I raise these kind of questions with them and challenge them about behaviours in the workplace, often they feel that the goalposts have moved from... You know, they acknowledge what's happening now, but they look back and they say, oh, but what I did 30 years ago might that come back to bite me, particularly if they're not people with a, a pattern of behaviour over many years, but we're young and foolish. And I'm wondering what your response is. So, Just to help me. So the goalposts have changed. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. The but goalposts have changed, which is a good thing. I mean, we are, we are in the moment, which is why I do think it's a sea change, and it is uncomfortable. Whenever you're in a moment of great societal change, it's uncomfortable. We are changing very deeply held and long held societal norms about how men and women interact in the workplace. Um, and that's to the good thing, that is to the good. But I will say one of the things that we as advocates also have to do is we have to create spaces for men to be a part of the conversation. We're not gonna solve this without men as allies, without men engaged, and there are many men who want to be part of this conversation. And we have to create, I have a lot of men who come to me who say, I want to be part of it, but I'm really worried about offending people. I don't know what to say if I go into a meeting. I'm not sure what language. We have to understand in our societal norms, in the broader culture, and you know this, for a rape culture, we have not equipped ourselves and our men. We have not equipped them with the tools and the language for how to engage in this, you know, and, and, and really deal with it. And so we have to create those spaces 
for people to do that. We have to be patient and not jump down the throats of someone who says something not exactly the right way. And we have to engage them and we have to teach people you know, how to do that. I was telling a story backstage about what we did with campus sexual assault in the United States, which was part of what we did was create a, a movement on campuses called It's On Us that was led by young people and particularly by young men on campus who are now standing up in 550 campuses across the US as the ca captain of the football team and the head of the fraternities and saying, actually, we support victims. We do not, you know, we want a culture that's different and we need to empower men to be able to do that. One of the, one of the angles that I think gets lost in a lot of the coverage about the Me Too coverage is that it wasn't just women who reported out these stories, and it wasn't just women who were our sources for these stories. The, the original reporting that I did about Fox News, it was me and my colleague Mike Schmidt, who's a man, and all of our editors were men, and I would say about half of our sources were men. And I think that that's something that really gets lost in all of this discussion, because it's not a women's issue. It's an issue about power, and it's an issue about respect. And I think that that's something that we really have to remember. I'm, I'm now gonna go up to microphone number three. Hi, uh, my question's about mentoring in the workplace, which is I think something Emily just mentioned before as well. As a young woman who's about to enter the workforce, as a journalist, I should add for context, um, I know that mentoring is really, really important. It's one of the best ways to get advice and get ahead and just learn from older colleagues. But of all the amazing things that have come out of Me Too and the way we look at sexual harassment in the workplace, one thing that I'm concerned about is the willingness of older males to now mentor young women. And whilst, yeah, the optimist in me says that workplaces are becoming more diverse and obviously there are women that you can look to as well, the reality is, especially in journalism, a lot of the senior people who could mentor you are men. And I worry that I might lose out on opportunities because of this. Not so a guardian in Australia, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it, it's part of that backlash. No, it's, it's a, it, it, it is a real concern. Um, and I think the way that we have to combat it is to talk about it, is to be open about it and raise those issues and then create spaces and create expectations for men who are in leadership to continue to mentor and create spaces and ways, you know, on, on how to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really not that hard. <laughs> it is, you know, be respectful, you know, you know, be, you know, make sure that you're treating, you know, everyone, you know, with respect and, you know, it, that, that it's, there, there's an aspect to this that, it's not that hard to do is in terms of how you're going to interact with somebody in the workplace. Well, and the other thing about this whole business of backlash and men worrying about how they should behave, they should worry about how they should behave. I mean, we've worried, we've worried forever about how we behave, so it's fine. <laughs> That's true. And, and the men, honestly, whom I've talked to who are worrying are the ones right. who should behave. And, and I mean, I'd be re it would be really kind of pathetic if some wise mentor decided that even though he's a good guy, he's now not going to do it. I just have trouble believing that that's going to happen in droves. So let, let's be real about the backlash. Uh, microphone number four. Oh. Thank you, firstly. Um, very similar to what you guys were touching on before. I look around this room and I'd say it's almost 80% female. I feel that we're not still engaging men in this conversation. So. And I don't think without doing that, we can really solve the greater problem as a whole. So what's your advice on how we can engage men a bit more in this discussion and get more men in this room talking about this issue? Yeah, well, thank you. Good question. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's critical. As what I said earlier, is I do think we have, and I advise my clients to do that, is create spaces where the conversation can be had and bringing men in because, you know, there are a lot of men who want to solve it. You know, one, one quick example, we just did, a, I do a lot of work for the Grammys on diversity and inclusion. Um, we had data, so one of the things we do need is to have data that shows, and one of the pieces of data from Stacey Smith at USC was that of all the music producers in the United States, only 2% are women, which is crazy. And we did an initiative around the Grammys two weeks ago to say to artists and labels and everyone, before you hire a, a producer for your next project, hire who you want, but consider at least two women in the mix. Put women in the mix as the hashtag. 500 artists, labels, managers, you know, people like Tony Bennett and Justin Bieber, you know, and Maroon 5, you know, including women artists, 
and labels and record labels, came, stepped up to be part of that, which tells me men want to be part of that. We have to give them the solutions. We've got to come up with ways like that on how they can take action to do it. And that's one of the things we collectively need to keep working on. Uh, let's go back to microphone three. Hi, um, I'm a director of a not-for-profit that takes on a role of watching over media and how it reports around, specifically around transgender people. Your c comments about how media has amplified the grassroots movement of Me Too and in you know, a feedback effect has been, I mean, it's, it's been extremely powerful. The arguments in favour of deconstructing some of those things like defamation law that put a handbrake on media, uh, how do you balance that against the fact that the media organisations, the two on the stage, uh, represented on the stage, um, are relatively responsible organisations, but the bulk of them are vast corporates themselves, riddled with exactly the same problems you've talked about at the other corporates. So how do you balance the fact that most of those larger media organisations are going to use any extra power they have to get around what currently are defamation laws to actually just play up the salaciousness mm -hmm. and go further into the backlash as well? Because um, they're going to have more power to actually backlash against women as well. Um, I would say that the media has to be very clear that we have to report on the media as well. We can't kind of make our own industry off limits and Emily's work is a fine example of that. Do you have a... And after, um, I mean, a, a lot of this reporting started in the media and that was one of the, the most kind of shocking and startling facts of all of this is after Bill O'Reilly at Fox News fell, then there were several other people, but that included Harvey Weinstein, who was a leader in Hollywood. There were a number of big news names in America, including Charlie Rose and Matt Lauer. And there were um, some editor, an editor at the New York Times. And the thing that I keep thinking about and is kind of how much the media does control the narrative of the story and how if you have these men who there were these allegations made against them, how does that change how we write about women, how we write about gender equality? And the same mirror that we're holding up against other organizations, we have to hold up against ourselves as well. Exactly, absolutely. Um, microphone number two. We've talked a lot today about, I guess, um, gender equality in the workplace. I'm particularly interested in your view in, I guess, how Me Too can relate to domestic violence and whether it has a space, um, I guess, moving beyond the workplace. Particularly in Australia here, um, I've been following uh, media related to domestic violence and we have a classic example this week where someone has been murdered by their partner and there is um, obviously reporting of that but we haven't got the traction that we've seen in Me Too uh, and that in a sense outrage that this is happening um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. So it's, um, I'll jump in, I, it, you know, we've been doing, I've worked in the domestic violence space for about 40 years in the United States, and, um, you know, I think there continues to need to be storytelling, because what really propelled in the United States the domestic violence movement that led to the Violence Against Women Act that then Senator Joe Biden authored was a tremendous amount of actually documenting and telling stories, because there is still... You know, if you don't do that, there is this notion that these are things that the women asked for, why don't they leave, you know, the, 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 you know, all of those. And you have to really document how pervasive it is, how it is not in one just sector of our society. You know, is it all socioeconomic sectors? It's in every community. Um, and the complexity of the, the circumstances that women find themselves in. Um, and that, that need, that's what actually, I think, changes the view, um, and we, I, I have to say that in the United States, I think we've progressed a great deal towards domestic violence, and there are a lot of companies that have stepped up. You know, we have not reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act, however, in the current Congress, but we have, you know, really invested a lot in a, a social network of shelters, 
Um, I mean, there's still a lot more to do, but there is at least that notion that people are believed, you know, and, and, and there is support available. But, you know, here's the thing about all of these movements, you can't let up, right? You know, the fact that we did it 40 years ago doesn't mean we get to not keep doing it or talking about it now. And um, we, this, this is the part that can sometimes get weary, wearying and, and tiring about it, but you really do have to continue and, and to keep at it. That's the same with rape culture. Right. right. And, and I think with domestic violence, again, I'm thinking about India and the connection between Me Too and domestic violence. It's very interesting because, for one thing, marital rape is not a, you know, it's not a crime in India. And domestic violence might be, but, you know, it's expected. It's fine to beat your wife. So it's not, I don't think there's been much Me Too out there in the social media space. But Me Too is part of the conversation, and so that it can't help but trickle down. And I found just in my own group of friends, Indian friends, feminists, who were actually posting on Me Too and talking about sexual harassment in the workplace, they were talking amongst themselves about more domestic stuff. They weren't posting it, but it was a conversation they hadn't had before. So even though it's not out there for the rest of us to see, it, it is starting to happen at, a, at another level, because you feel loyal and you feel protective and you don't want to put that out there the way you might not feel about your employer. So it does make a difference, but you know, it's, it's no use complaining when the law isn't even on your side. Do you want to say anything to that? So I'm afraid we've run out of time, which is uh, kind of upsetting because it's been so much fun. <laughs> um, I want to, you all to uh, join me in thanking our three panelists, Sahila, Emily and Tina for such a great conversation. <laughs> and, and we would like to thank you for coming along, for listening, for participating, and for being part of this conversation. Yeah. Thank you.